<laughs> Hello, beautiful human. Very few things in this world make me happier than cracking a Celsius with an old friend. Yeah! And that's Cheers. what we're doing. Hello, Nat Wolf. Welcome to the studio. Thanks for having me. We're just saying that Celsius has been billed as the new healthy energy drink, but we think... Um, this is probably taking a year off our life, just this watermelon one. With every yeah. sip I take, I lose an Six hour. Months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> it's really messed up, but also it's so delicious and it keeps me going. My personality is just like I can feel it. It's like oh, it's like a phone that's turning on <laughs> and it's been on red. You know, it's like when it's red and the thing, and then now and now it's like the apple is coming on, and now I'm like, Ooh. you're charging up. I'm charging up. So, I know you a long time, and I know who you are as a human being, and I know you like as a person and as fucking Nat, but you are also really, truly a fucking movie star. And I do wonder often, people who slip out of themselves and into other people pretty often, do you end up ever losing who you are or questioning or forgetting who you are from <laughs> getting so deep question. into a bunch of other people? Zach, starting it off, I'm only three sips into my Celsius. <laughs> yeah, better, better start chugging. Um <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that one of the great things in the way that I've been working, at least in the last seven years or seven or eight years, I met an acting teacher guru lady that sort of changed the way that I approached acting in a lot of ways is that I think with each part of trying to get closer to myself, trying to go deeper into understanding who I am. So, um, you know, in the same moment where you can you you're trying to lose yourself you're also trying to to learn more about yourself so at the end of every job hopefully by the end I feel in some way healed by doing it um but then but then yeah there's usually this weird adjustment period I just did a play for six months I mean not the the run was in six months but the whole experience was six months because we were rehearsing and and the play was so dark and so intense um it's this little uh, unknown player at checkoff um no, uh, he, he th th it was like an updated version of the seagull, and uh, at the end of it, it was a really strange adjustment period where I I I got back here and I felt kind of like an alien in my my own body, and then um and then about about a month goes by, you hang out with great friends like Zach Sang, and and I get to be with my brother, and that's there's there's these grounding things where you come back, but yeah, it is like visiting another planet, and then yeah. And you do that with Harry Neff and like decent cast on that, but why, why stage? Like you don't necessarily need to do that. And I'm sure you get. I mean, you're also in a fucking pretty big Amazon Prime series. By the way, watch it. The <laughs> consultant, check it out. I did earlier confuse it for the Citadel, but if you didn't know, we work at Amazon, <laughs> and there's literally billboards for all of this shit. So right, right. I got to confuse with the other C titled show. Right, that exists I, I on did the see a billboard of Christoph Waltz, who's in the consultant next to citadel oh, sure. um so i did think yeah i could see how you could you know you i confused. could see how you do it i mean to be fair you should show today. that zach Sang has not watched his friend nat's show clearly <laughs> um, yeah. I um watched show and yet. and it seems like he hasn't watched citadel because <laughs> i'm certainly not in citadel either <laughs> you don't need to do stage but there there's but there has to be a deeper reason and meaning behind it right um, I, I, I really, really love, love, love doing it. I mean, I, I did, uh, a play at the same theater, Barry Child, the Sam Shepard play, um, in 2016. And it was right before Sam Shepard passed away and he'd been one of my heroes. And while we were rehearsing, he was bringing in his friends like Patti Smith and Jessica Lang and all these, you know, these heroes of mine. And, um, and I thought it's so wild that, you know, as an, uh, as a musician, you don't have very many opportunities to jam with, you know, the greatest uh, musicians. You know, it just doesn't, that's just not what happens. Or I know um, movie directors will always say, like, what's it like on this director's set? Or what's it like? Because they don't get to visit each other's sets. But as actors, you get to, I get to work with somebody like Christoph Waltz or I get to work with somebody like Sam Shepard. I, I do, you do so many different projects in a year, you get to work with all these, these incredible people. Here comes a Celsius. I feel it. <laughs> <laughs> Brain starting to wake up. Welcome. Um, no, and and uh, but being you know doing this play, it's 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 regenerative. Like I I feel as an actor, I just start to come back to, to life, and and then I got to have some of my my heroes came to see the play, and you know said really really positive great things, and so it, it's a it's a yeah. I mean I I love doing it, and also you you get the best material a lot of the times. I mean, this is a play, it's been updated, but it's a play that was written in the late 1800s and the themes are just so deep and incredible that 
that um, every night you're doing it, you hear something new. And um, is but, that the goal to make when you're doing a play that's repetitive and you're yeah, doing yeah, it yeah. numerous times a week? Is it the goal to make it new to you every time, or I mean, before you step out on stage, is there do you set expectations for yourself? I think the goal is to uh, to 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 play it however it 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 you know, to let it play you. So sometimes you wake up and you're like, I'm just in a bad mood. And then you're like, I'm going to, I'm going to, that's where I'm going to be. That's where I start, you know, not trying to control it too much, trying to let yourself go with whatever, you know, and then if something happens, like we had a cast member get COVID who was, you know, um, so we had a week of shows where the director who hadn't acted in 30 years came on stage and had sides or like had like the script pages in his hands and, you know, didn't know any of the lines by heart. It was a, it, and, and I was panicking. And then um, I had to be like, all right, I'm just going to embrace this. And I had some great shows by the end of the week. You know, the first show that we did with him was I, 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 I was trying to control it and being like doing. But then I thought I got to just do this completely differently because he's not at all like the other actor. And uh, and, uh, you know, because he doesn't, you know, in the original with the original actor, he was very caretaking. He would take care of me in the scenes. And then... Um, what do you mean by that? Well, like, his character took care of, took care of my character in the, in, the, in the story. You know, my, my character is this kid who is, is not unlike... Do you guys watch Succession? Yeah. It's, it's, so there were some similarities to Kendall. Like, you know, a kid that's, like, d- doesn't feel love. And in and, and the absence of love, you, you, you go for power. So he wants to be successful and... Um, and his mom is really awful to him, and and uh, this this character that David Kale plays is the only nice one to him in the entire play, <laughs> and uh, and the only one who's loving to him. And then when that actor left, and they brought in this other actor who was, I was like, oh, I went from having one character that was nice to me to zero, but suddenly then I thought, oh, I can be, I can try to be the caretaker to him because he's the 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 director who does another lines because he's it's first time on stage in thirty years. And does that change the story? It did a little bit, yeah, yeah. But um, but you know, like we had Mark Ruffalo came to the show, which was so cool. And he came <laughs> randomly to one of the three shows that the director was there for, and uh, he was like, "Your guy's relationship was so beautiful," and I was like, "Holy shit, really?" So it's you know, you never know what's gonna. That's pop off. It was a, it was a really, it's a really incredible experience. I can't wait to do, I'm, I, I'm supposed to do another play in like a year, but at the end of it, I did think, I know why people take years off doing this because I felt like I had to go to like a back doctor. My back was hurting my thing. I'm like, I feel like I aged 10 years. But it's By the way, I'm 40 now. Zach. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> I was yeah. going to say something, but I didn't yeah. want to offend you. It's been a minute. Yeah. But, it is thrilling and challenging in a way that, like, a, a movie set or a TV show set could just never fucking offer. Oh, no, you get a second take if you fuck up. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, what, I do know that I was really panicked about, um, I was panicked about, you know, messing up lines or this or that. And I never messed up lines until we had one show where I was just like, this is the greatest. I was like, I am fucking invincible i'm like this is the greatest it felt like i had had by the way we drank celsius during the show we drank a lot <laughs> Har, hari neff she drinks tons of celsius um but there was this line where i said um do you ever watch wait did you ever watch keeping up with the kardashians and um i was just really in the in the zone and i go did you ever read and then i go keeping up with the kardashians and the actress goes did I ever read Keeping Up with the Kardashians? And I'm like, yeah, the the book based on the television show. We're improvising about Keeping Up with the Kardashians, and um, so that was my that was my moment of just completely falling flat on my That's face. That's fucking but, fun, yeah, though. It was fun in a way that, like, again, like the safety and security that you get from a set. Like, at the end of the day, like you you have a bunch of obligations when you work on a TV show or a movie, right? The biggest one is to show up on time and get it done as yeah. efficiently as humanly possible yeah. to not go over and waste everybody's day. Right, totally. But I mean, no double takes. You have to memorize everything. You have to be able to move and flow as it's happening while st- still keeping track as to where you're going. Like, that's yeah. exciting. It's exciting. It's it's exciting and traumatic. Yeah, <laughs> fucking incredible. Especially because the end of this play, I had to kill myself every single night. So I'd have to mm. go from this innocent kid to just a complete downward trajectory. So I'd end the play kind of like, uh, you know. So where do you? Wh- if the goal is to get closer to yourself from every role that you take, what do you learn about yourself from doing this? 
it was interesting. I had my therapist come actually, and he said, "This is." He's like, "You're basically living through all if we're through every artist's worst fears." <laughs> you know, that's crazy. You know, because my and, and he, you know is unrequited love. The girl doesn't love me back. Um, she loves my mother's boyfriend, <laughs> and uh, and also I'm a, a a total failure as a writer. So it's like you're living through artistic failure in a weird way. Um, it, it since then I felt a little bit more resilient and a little bit calmer i don't know why i think it's just i got to live through the world it's like exposure therapy or something <laughs> now you're afraid of spiders or something and then they put you in a room with spiders it's like if you're afraid of failing or afraid of your if you're really afraid of your girlfriend loving your mother's boyfriend then uh <laughs> <laughs> experience it like, experience it eight six, times a week yeah, yeah. that's crazy <laughs> But by the way, we're here to discuss a bunch of things, including Table for Two. It's a brand new album from Nat and Alex Wolf. We're going to put a link in the description below. You can listen to all of it on Amazon Music. Um, you know, do you feel like this entire universe that you've created was for yourself, this this path that you've paved for yourself? Do you believe that it was somewhat manifested? I had no idea until today that you had a sign that was hung up on your door that said, <laughs> I want to be a child actor. Yeah, that um, that's a story that's embarrassing. Why? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had seen Spy Kids 3D. Do you remember Spy Kids 3D? Do I fucking remember? Spy and Kids I was like, 3D. I want to fucking be in Spy Kids. And then my parents wouldn't let me. Um, which I'm happy they didn't let me be. A, you know, a re you know, I was. We were on the Naked Brothers band, but that was very insulated. It was in the summer. It was with my brothers, with all my friends. But we had to go to school. We weren't allowed to audition for anything. And I'm happy now, in retrospect, that my parents. But at the time, you know, because people were saying you could audition for this movie, you could. And my parents weren't letting me, and so I wrote the sign on my door. I want to be in fucking Spy Kids. <laughs> <laughs> that was basically it. I just remember, who, what was the actor's name in Spy Kids? It was so cool. Junie. Daryl Sabara. Daryl Sabara. He's so awesome. And and he played Junie, yeah, right? Yeah, Junie Cortez. Like, Junie. Butterfingers. Butterfingers. <laughs> and he had all the Band-Aids on his fingers. Yeah. I was like, I could be in Spy Kids. I could be that. I could have those warts. <laughs> and, I mean, in, in kind of you did. But it's wild that you you go from 2009 to 2011, you don't do anything. Besides... Yeah, we, 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 we toured, we toured, um, wait, what were those years? Yeah, we toured, um, doing music and stuff, but really I was just in school and, um, it was kind of a good time to not do anything. Uh, I went into, it was, it was really strange. Like we became super famous when we were, when, when I was nine or when I was like 11 to when I was 13 and everybody in our in our school and, and the kids in our lives and stuff, they were very weird about it. It was very odd, you know, and they, they, they it wasn't, everybody was saying, were you super popular in middle school? And I was like, it was the opposite. We were kind of, both my brother and me, um, kind of ostracized and kind of bullied for being, and then outside of school, there would be crowds lining up outside of our middle school. I mean, it was really trippy. And then, um, and I felt kind of uncomfortable. And then I grew you know, a bunch of inches and I got like kind of acne and my hair changed all the stuff. And, and suddenly I wasn't famous anymore. And it was, and, 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 um, and at that time I kind of loved it because I was, it felt really uncomfortable to have that thrown into my life. And then at about 17 or 18, I started working again and it kind of happened again. And I was more ready for, it. I was just, you know, what pulled you back? Human. Well, I was still into, I was still so, excited about being a musician and touring and being an actor um but i think you know this business is traumatic and i think being a young person in this business you know i would i would never want you know if, if i have kids i would never <laughs> i would be so worried for them if they were in it you know it's it's um and your parents knew firsthand you they, know? they knew firsthand and they were really you know i have to they did a really great job of sh of shielding us from a lot of the, from a lot of it, but you can feel it anyway, you know, um, uh, you can even feel it with suddenly less people were coming to our concerts and we're like, what the fuck is going on? But then, um, you know, then it just made it. So I started studying with acting teachers and I started, you know, Alex and I started getting into different kinds of music and movies and it, it ended up, I think those years, whatever those years were, 2009, 2012 were sort of like the growing years. And then we came back more as, young adults with a new uh, with an album black sheep which is fucking amazing but then you you get a role in new year's eve 
Yeah, my 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 one line in New Year's Eve just killed. I I mean, changes your life. Changes my life. Changes my life. Um, that was actually a blast. I I uh, I, I I do remember. You know, they they I didn't have a line, but then she said like, "Who are you gonna kiss on New Year's Eve?" And I said, "How about you, baby?" And then that made into the. It's good. <laughs> so I'll still get people who send me little screenshots of me in that movie. <laughs> I mean, is that weird that that is really your one of your first three projects back? Yeah, like, yeah, that that was a. I mean, it, you know what's also crazy that I won an Oscar for it, which you would never <laughs> have believed, and I had no idea it was coming too. And then he said, "That's the first time somebody's won an Oscar for one line." <laughs> It was super strange. Did you did you, did you guys expect that when no, you won? No. Yeah, it was fucking it weird. Came out of nowhere. It came out of nowhere. Did you even and audition for that shit? No. No. Yeah, I auditioned to play Jake T. Austin's part, and then they said, you know, we're not going to give this part to you, but we'll give you, we'll let you be this other guy. Wait, first of all, how incredibly humbling. Sometimes you got to take the L, you know, <laughs> to get the W. Look at you to now. Get the w. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> I will say then Jake T. Austin came to my um, high school and my one memory of going to high school with him is that he asked me to pee in a cup for him to give it to his drug. T- he was getting drug tested <laughs> for his show or something. And he ended up doing drugs. Yeah. Well, ever- so, uh, you know, he owes me because I did I did pee in a cup for him and, uh, and you technically- <laughs> I think he passed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God, he was crazy. I forgot that he went to that school, and then he wanted to fight me one time at a party. Holy shit, he wanted to fight you? Yeah, you know whose house I was at? What? Um, uh, Abbott's. Do you remember that kid? Uh, Abbott. What's his what fuck? Was this Ian story? Abbott. Ian Abbott. He's Whoa, that is a blast. Super wealthy. Right. I remember he wanted to fight me, and somebody goes, "Wait, Ian didn't want to fight you." No, no, no. no. J. Austin, Austin at his house, and I remember he wanted to fight me, and then somebody goes, "That painting's worth thirty-six million dollars." I was like, "Oh shit!" Why do you want to fight you? Um, so you guys know. were going to fight and maybe potentially knock over a $30 million yeah, painting. Yeah, you never know when we tussle. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I remember, an old-timey boxer. I remember vaguely. I mean, I really love... I, I, he never tried to fight me. He was always really sweet <laughs> to me. But I do remember... Um, I would have had your back, for <laughs> sure, you Zach. So um, I do remember him saying, Hey, man, I'm working on this set. I was in L.A. He was doing this show. It was on, it was on Disney or... Yeah, Wizards. Re- no, no, this was post-Wizards. He was like a, it was a family show or something. But he was saying, I need to get some furniture, so I'm going to steal some furniture off the set. Do you want to help me steal some furniture off the set? <laughs> and I said, that sounds illegal. <laughs> and I'm not going to do that. But I remember one of my other friends did help him take like a desk or something, and he got caught trying to take a desk yeah, off duh, the duh. set. <laughs> He's like, they don't even use it. It's there for the whole year. I'll bring it back before the next season. <laughs> like, I think you got to get your own desk. That's a true story. That sounds like a good time. It's actually terrifying. <laughs> it's true. And that's what freaks me out. Yeah. That's genuinely what freaks me the fuck out. Um, do you remember going into the audition room for the first time after all those years? I mean, that must be scary as shit. I do remember. Yeah, I remember going in to audition for the Coen brothers and I was sitting in the waiting room, which is still probably the coolest audition I've ever done. <laughs> I was sitting in a ra- waiting room and I was right next to Amanda Pete, who I remember being kind of a childhood crush. And she was like, are you nervous? We obviously weren't auditioning for the same part, but she was auditioning for them. She was like, are you nervous? And I was like, no, I don't think I am. And then I walked outside and threw up in a <laughs> trash can outside. And then I was like, came in, you know, wiped the vomit off my mouth. <laughs> Came in and did the audition for the for the the Cohen brothers. Yeah, that's. I mean, when you get an audition like that and you get a look like that, is that reassuring to keep going? Yeah, I actually remember them saying something really, really um, nice. Uh, I think they said that. Um, well, now I'm, I'm not just going to brag on here, but they said something really, really nice about and and and. You should brag. I think they said. You're an excellent actor, uh, but you're too handsome for the role. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> no way. So, yeah, man, if the Coens think you're handsome, if you Coens think you're handsome, then you're handsome. That's, that's... Um, no, I've gotten definitely not handsome enough all the time, too. I remember, so my friend Austin Abrams, who's an incredible actor and one of my best friends, 
we always talk about how how traumatizing it was that all of our auditions from 15 to 20 were like awkward weird social lo- social outcast loner <laughs> and like the the weird looking kid the, the odd one and the thing you know it like totally has an effect on your self esteem um but no that was one of the examples of the other where but they were the Cohen brothers were you know my my favorite they were like one of my 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 introductions into loving movies what are you going out for now like what, what when you get the when you get the the breakdown of the character what do, what what are you seeing <laughs> i mean now finally i'm i i said uh, a couple years ago i was like i just can't have like wear a backpack anymore <laughs> it's just like i'm just tired of wearing a fucking backpack <laughs> and things and like slamming locker doors and being like, oh, she, you know, I can't go to prom anymore. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm finally old enough where, like, so now I'm not going to prom. Suddenly I'm playing adults, which has been really, really nice. Um, I don't know. Weirdly enough, <clears throat> um, it's been in the last, like, two and a half years, it's just been so much better. It's just since I've gotten a little older, it's just the parts have been so much better. And I'm finally working on things that I'm really... Like the exact type of things I want to work on. You played yeah. Joe Exotic's husband. Yeah, that was, was fucking amazing. You're lo- fucking great. In it. <laughs> oh, you watched that? Of course I did. And that was so sweet of you to come to the play and watch <laughs> Citadel. <laughs> what was your favorite episode of Citadel? Uh, the first five minutes I attempted to watch. And turned off. Um, no, yeah, Joe. The Joe. The Joe versus Carol. That tr- I was so obsessed with the Tiger King show when it came out during co- during lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I watched it in like two hours and then, and I, I remember thinking that that guy was so heartbreaking and, uh, the, and, and, uh, yeah, that was one of my favorite experiences. And I got to go down to Australia, but they had like a mandatory lockdown then where you had to stay in a hotel room for two weeks and just quarantine by yourself. And you start really talking to yourself oh, and yeah. going, I mean, you go fucking insane. You're just like. I've never had that before where I'm just sort of mumbling to myself around. I mean, and then one time, you know, I went to go put my trash in the hallway. I put my face too far outside the door and they called the cops what? and the cops called my hotel room. And like, you can't leave because COVID lockdown was just so intense. And then somebody hooked up with a security guard to get let out and they let out COVID into all of Australia. So shut up. That's a true story. That's a true story. When I was in the hotel, somebody, it, it wasn't on our show, but somebody who was, Hollywood adjacent <laughs> hooked up <laughs> with the security guard and got let out and then brought COVID into the world. Yeah. What an experience to just be a part of. I know. I know. I know. What the fuck? I know. That's yeah. crazy. I know. It wasn't me. When you're sitting <laughs> locked in, do you actually have a script to start working on or are you just really alone with your thoughts? I did have a script to start working on and they gave me a little workout thing. So I would just kind of like run on the bike <laughs> and then <laughs> lift weights and then like watch a movie. And then, and you can't talk to me because Australia, the time difference is so, so everybody's yeah, yeah. asleep. So I'm calling people in the middle of the night. I'm like, Hey dad, what's up, man? He's like, hey, it's four in the morning. I'm like, you are probably just getting up now. Right. He's like, Not at all. I'm like, <laughs> Like, fucking anybody talked to me. Yeah. I called Zach saying a lot, but he never answered. Definitely didn't answer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you, eat, okay, when you read a, the breakdown, like, is there any part of you that's a little bit nervous to go out for a role like that? Or do you know that it's like, I mean, as kitschy and as corny as it could be, it's also incredibly relevant. Kate McKinnon's a part of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally loved the kitschiness of the, of, and I also found that character specifically so heartbreaking because he was a really sweet kid and he had he had had this horrible, awful childhood and he really loved Joe. I mean, as crazy as that is, it's like it's really I was just sad. watching that um, that this new basically cult documentary called Stolen Youth about mm-hmm. these Sarah Lawrence kids that were taken in by this this creepy cult guy. And you realize that these people are just lonely and, and desperate. It's not, they're not all stupid. You know, that's not, <clears throat> I mean, maybe some of them are stupid and that's how they get taken in, but sometimes they're smart. They're just sad. And they, you know, they think, Oh, I'm getting love and I'm just gonna, you know, go for it. So I found that character really, really heartbreaking and great. And I had, had an uh, incredible time. Um, but, uh, and yeah, John Cameron Mitchell was amazing. And there's actor Sam Keeley who played the other husband. It was so good. And, and, uh, yeah, and, and somehow the scripts, they didn't get creepy. They, they, they didn't get, um, creepy is the wrong word because it was a little creepy, but it didn't get, it wasn't like poverty porn. It wasn't like they were making fun of these people who were, um, you know, poor and sad. It was it was kind of heartfelt. 
It was you know. a totally different look on, in, into a story yeah. that really people, tens of millions of people grew to love mm-hmm. and get, not love, but get so deeply invested. Yeah. Honestly. It, you worked there at the zoo, right? Yeah, yeah. I actually yeah. lost a limb. You where, Which one? Uh, this one. It's back now. The finger? It grew yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. It grew back. Well, it's a digit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, a digit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not a limb, right? Yeah, well, yeah. well, yeah. That, they grew it on a, a rat, and they, <laughs> they reattached it to me. Um, modern medicine, brother. It's pretty fucking sick. Yeah, man. Um, <laughs> there's something... I, uh, by the way, I want to talk table for two, and we're going to dissect this album where, like, you have songs that are close to six minutes on it. You just don't care. I was trying to test your... Your your attention span. Oh, we tuned you. in, baby. Winter baby. Um, winter baby. Hey, baby. Hey, winter baby. <laughs> I mean, when you're making music today compared to when you were making music before, what is the biggest change? Like, between a Black Sheep era or even Glue yeah. compared to this most recent body of work? Yeah, yeah. Well, Glue is going to be technically on the record. Even what? Though we did. We did put it out separately. But, yeah, we just... we just First of have... all, you released Glue, like, years ago. Yeah, we released Glue 10 years <laughs> ago. Yeah. You, what? Yeah. We're, we're going to employ Zach as a manager because, obviously, things are going off the rails. No. Um... <laughs> Uh, so this album, we 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 really we had written a bunch of songs, but really during lockdown, it was me and my my ex girlfriend. She was my girlfriend at the time. My brother, his girlfriend, I and love my friend Austin. Rosie. You love, isn't she the gr- she's, she's the best, a superstar. Yeah. And yeah. Y- you know, it's so funny. I one of my best friends, we for like a week straight just listened to her song on fucking repeat. Which one was it? Best friends. Best friends. So good. Did you listen with your best friend? I did. I did, actually. Am I your best friend? I mean, you're on the list. Who's your best friend? Is Ariana your best friend? Um, She's on very close to the top of Who's the list. Who's the top? Yeah. Um, I don't, like, have... I don't, I don't have a, I don't like you don't have a hierarchy? Yeah, I can't, I can't put one person on... You know, I can't. Am I in the top 20? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're a little bit more narrow. You to think? say I have 20 friends is a <laughs> fucking big deal, brother. You're Jesus, like, that would be it. so much. Damn. <laughs> you know, it's. I was looking today at the photo the first time we ever met, and it's horrendous. Fuck. I've known you since... Fuck. How old were we? Uh, it's 2008. So what's the year on that? What's the Wow, man. Yeah, so 2008 to 2023. That's like 15 years. Yeah. You haven't known you in a long time. So I was 13 or 12 or something? Yes. That's insane. Yeah, it's gross. How old are you now? 30 now. What I'm are you? 28, 20? yeah. That's insane. I thought that you said you were 40. Or, what? I thought you said you were 40 earlier. Yeah, I'm 40, but I tell people I'm 28, so <laughs> it just makes me sound younger. <laughs> are you afraid of getting older? Not anymore. I kind of was at 25. I have a song on the album called 25, and I remember being like, ooh, this is scary because, uh, you know, this means I'm halfway through my t- 20s. I'm supposed to be an adult. Suddenly, being an adult is feeling better. It's starting yeah. to be, this is starting to feel good. Like everybody's saying, "Oh, you're in your Saturn return," but I just got a house. <gasps> I just got a place. Yeah, last week actually. Congratulations! Yeah. A week, one week ago. I What's know. your address? I'm really excited. <laughs> 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 I actually haven't moved in yet, but I've been driving by every night. <laughs> I swear to God, it's not so even a joke. Great. I've been driving by like a stalker. Like the, the people who live there are still there. I've been driving by and then the, the homeowner came out. She goes, my daughter says that there's somebody who keeps driving by. I'm like, I'm so sorry. That is me. I'm just so excited. I, I will come out. She's like, did you come by at like 1130 p.m.? I'm like, I did. I was super high. And uh, my friend and I just wanted to show him the place. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a physical manifestation and a tangible representation of really decades of hard work. It's true. I yeah, I mean it's true. It was it was it's one of those things where I felt like it's really a adult it felt like an adult step. It's my first time having my own place and it's amazing. yeah, yeah. I'm really really excited uh, and I can't wait to have you over. You you live here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What what area are you in? I'm in West Hollywood. Nice, dude. This yeah, is I... in Beachwood. Canyon. Oh my god. Mm, yeah, yeah. Look at you. <laughs> Look at you. That's really you should be so proud of yourself. Thanks, man. I know. I'm really really excited about it. But um and it's got a little studio. So it'll be, yeah. When you're making music with the four of you, I mean, that seems like it either can go incredibly well or incredibly hostile and tense and lead to maybe the end of a relationship. Um, <laughs> um, you mean with, with uh, who are you talking about? I mean, you're making this out, al- you made this album with your ex, Rosie no, 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 and no, Alex. My, my ex wasn't involved in the album. No, we were just all living together during, during. Okay, got it, got it. Got it. That, would be, that would be insane. She, she wasn't a musician. That would be crazy. <laughs> but she did take some good photographs. Um, 
before she broke my heart. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, damn. Um, <laughs> she, she, it was, it's, it's, we're all good and we're friends. You know how that happens where you get out of a relationship and it's a little rocky at first and then, you and then after out. a while you kind of, you heal up and, and then you can all be friends Did again. she cheat but, on you? No, she didn't. She didn't. No. Nobody cheated on each other. It was honestly COVID, I think, was really, was was hard on relationships. I think I think you lockdown either, was like, hard. You either got married in COVID or exactly. fucking broke up. It was going to go one way or the other. You know, I think it was, it's like too much. It's too, it's too much. It was too much for even, you know, one of my best friends. We had, you know, everybody has to get to heal after that because it was, it was a strange time. It was um, But, uh, no, I mean, my brother and I were in that. It was the first time we were living together since we were in high school. <laughs> And uh, and it was so fun. And then we, we had all these songs. We played them for each other and we worked on them. And then when things started to open up, we booked a studio for 11 days because we heard that's what a lot of our favorite bands would do albums in 11 days. And we're like, we're not going to go over this time period and we're just going to do all these songs. So we And we just did the two of us. So we were we would get there to the studio, get early, and then just like run back and forth to different <laughs> instruments. And we had rehearsed it so much that we were ready to go. And um, And then, you know, because we have a tendency to just take forever to do everything um and be perfectionistic so this was the opportunity to do the opposite and just like hit the ground running so it was an amazing a really really amazing experience like what drives the want to still make music outside of the fact that you're telling stories that are incredibly relatable still i mean and by the way that's a through line to the music you've been making since the very beginning Thanks, buddy. I mean, yeah. it's it's accurate like dude going back to naked brothers like you were talking yeah, yeah. about shit that really People fucking felt right. People, right. I mean, kids, people your age, our age, like they felt understood by it. It's interesting that a lot of the our 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 fan base has been the exact exact same age as us. I don't know if that's the case with a lot of people, but just the fact that they start off as kids at the same time we started off as kids, and we're one of the only um, young kid groups that I we never wrote with adults. So we only we did it all ourselves. So I think when you heard the songs, they were coming from kids and and that's why i you know i know a lot of people who i know who were in this business when they're young they feel embarrassed by their music or things that they did when we were kids and i I, we don't because it really came from us then i think um i did one songwriting session with with adults like with these you know people in their 40s or something when i was 13 and i i walked out and i said i I got there and they played me a track and they said okay you want to write a song to this i said that song's already written (laughs) How are we going to write a song to this? And then they go, well, we can write lyrics together. And then I was like, I think I need to go in this room to write lyrics by myself. And then I just said, I think I got to go home. (laughs) And I left. And I never did that again because it was like, I think since the beginning, one of the things and one of the reasons why we keep doing music is it is a it's been a really organic way to express ourselves. And it's been a real way to connect with my brother. I mean, he's my best friend and. And it's 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 magical when when we get together and do it for, for us. It's magical, and then it's amazing to see people that you know we've been friends, but also we've been kind of working together uh-huh. since we were kid. You know, in this, you've been doing this. You know, I always knew that you would blow up like you have. You know, okay, okay. and uh, and we 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 basically my 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 brother and I. Anytime we're away from each other, we're still sending each other music, and and still. You know, it's usually on voice memo or something. We'll send each other voice memos, and and I feel like the fan base has kind of grown. Do you feel like you're really making this. it for you first? Because like it is like yeah. a selfish thing to keep you close to Alex and to express yeah, yourself, yeah, yeah. and it is really special, yeah. especially because you guys are also paralleled going and doing. It is like you guys are both movie stars. <laughs> like the chances of that is, is really wild. <laughs> yeah, it's been amazing, and and. Uh, Maybe it's because we're so incredibly supportive of each other too, um, and it's 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 you know, and there will be some, you know, like when we were doing the album, we had a ping pong table in the studio, and we had all this competitive energy that would come out when we were playing ping pong, but that's where the competitive energy comes out. We really aren't. Um, it's really weird. We aren't competitive with each other. We're really supportive, and um, and it does. I do feel like. It's us against the world in a certain way, and and I and and I think what works with the music is that if you make something really personal, which is expressing yourself or connecting to your brother or whatever it is, um, then it connects with other people. It's like it's like I went to see the National last night at the Greek, and they were so amazing. And he was saying this, 
he was singing this line uh, over and over again, and I, I thought, I don't really understand what that lyric means, but I can feel how much it means to him, and so it means something to me, you know? It, it kind of rattled my insides because it meant so much to him. And I thought, oh, that's sort of the gift of art. You know, you express something and you don't really, you know, the audience doesn't really have to intellectually understand it, but they understand where the deep feeling is coming from and, and it resonates in them. They feel the emotion. Yeah. And when when you're making music, just you and Alex, yeah. how do you know that you're evolving or getting better if it's just between the two of you? Do you need unbiased ears mixed into that equation? That's a, such a good question. Um, I don't know. I think we can be pretty harsh with each other about, you know, we help each other out with songs. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to say. I mean, I, I think once we record the music, we will definitely bring it to people that we really trust. Do you go to your dad? We went to my dad this time because he plays on the album, and I wrote a song about that, that that is sort of about his struggle with cancer and my struggle with dealing with his cancer and stuff. He's doing much better now, but it was really touch and go for a while. And there's this song on the album called "Shake" in parentheses, all my plans. Um, but he plays this piano part in the beginning, and uh, so we brought him into the studio, and he had made out a chart, but he never really listened to the lyrics. And then he saw the lyrics were printed out, and he saw them. And he started to cry, and my dad doesn't cry that often. He started to cry, and then he goes, all right, put me in the studio. And then he played the piano, and it was just like, and he goes, okay, I'll do another one. We're like, no, come on, <laughs> bring it in. By yeah. the way, their dad, their dad is one of the greatest fucking musicians <coughs> out there. I mean, <coughs> allergy. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. <coughs> Not <up> COVID. <laughs> Not sick. <laughs> <Good> <laughs> no, but your dad is one of the greatest fucking musicians. And yeah, ever. Publicly, yeah. He, was Arsenio Hall's band leader, but yeah, like yeah, yeah. did a bunch of shit before and after. An incredible jazz pianist mm -hmm. and jazz musician, right? Amazing jazz pianist and, and jazz musician. And yeah, I mean, at a certain point, you got to stop, you know, showing your stuff to your parents before you put it out because it's just, you know, I mean, the hard part is, is they're so brilliant, but you also have to kind of not totally rely on 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 them as much you know it's like the usual growing up so when we were about remember when i was about 16 and alex was about 13 we had to kind of distance ourselves from our parents but now we've kind of come back but that's life yeah, too right life. that's like yeah. maturing and evolving as <laughs> yeah. a human being yeah do you i, I mean I, i'm gonna ask a question and you can answer or not i'm just interested I, what does nepotism even mean to you because it's weird like i forget and i've known you again yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. 15 years yeah i fucking totally forget that your mom was an incredible actress, writer, director. Right, 30 right. 30-something. She wrote Naked Brothers Band. Yeah. The movie turns it into a TV show that runs three seasons. Yeah. And I forget that your dad, I mean, you come from incredible Musician. lineage. Yeah, I mean, in the way that, you know, I don't know how many, you know, well, the show, that was a huge, a huge boon. I don't know how many career opportunities we got from our parents, but definitely just being in a house. telling me your mom didn't call in that New <laughs> yeah. Year's Eve role? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, like, you know, and, and neither of our parents are super famous or anything, but... They were incredible artists. Yeah. So we grew up in a house where my dad was always, you know, we'd wake up in the morning and he was always playing the piano. And, and then, you know, you'd see my mom constantly doing, you know, uh, writing scripts and the, and just being around that. I remember this Mr. Rogers video where he's like, attitudes are caught. They're not taught. So just the the idea That's of so true isn't that so true yeah, yeah yeah so just being around people that were so they were such passionate artists and you know success would come in and out for them but but just but they never they never wavered in feeling so passionate i think alex and i both took that on so in that way we we're you know so lucky and and also we have just a really good north star that they and they would always say that they're like you know this business is 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 um is heartbreaking and it's also inconsistent and it, and it doesn't hold your hand and it's not there for you it's but um <clears throat> as long as you really care about the stuff that you're putting out into the world um but you know it's like uh there's been a lot of i mean like my my ex girl from margaret who i know um, you know you know she's she her mom is uh, annie mcdowell and she's She's but she's a brilliant actress and has nothing to do. I mean, you know, it has nothing to do with that. She just happens to be. A, so, I mean, I think some I mean, it's totally, you know, you totally see um, how just like with anything, it's 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 
things are unfair or unbalanced. But but a lot of these people are talent are talented, yeah. you know, and talent and talent is I think talent can be hereditary. You uh, hereditary, huh? <laughs> uh, hereditary. That consistency and that following your passion. I mean, do you lean on that to get you through between 2009 and 2011 and even beyond that? Like, there had to have been something that just kept you going when you really didn't need to. Yeah, I mean, I have, yeah, it's always been about, I mean, you can, t I can totally get sucked up into the world of wanting to be liked or wanting to be successful. But really, I'm so passionate about acting and theater and films and music and um and it's it is it is almost it's almost like a, a religion to me and and it is kept me it's kept me sane you know and uh and it is also a good place to funnel all of the the extra feelings that that I have and that I know my brother has um I do feel like if I'm not being creative I feel um, antsy. So so it's a great... It, you know, I feel just really lucky I have those outlets. What are you about to say? Is this your first album in like, 12, like 10, 12 years? We put out an, uh, something in 2016 that was like nine, nine, nine tracks okay. um, that was called Public Places. But besides that, yeah. yeah. So, so what took so long to put out a, a new album, like a complete full body? <clears throat> I think it's just been the, the... We've been writing the whole time. I think the acting careers have taken my brother and I physically away from each other so much and it took COVID lockdown to actually just have us in the same room you'd be like we gotta do something um it's like we haven't been on tour in a really long time and for this album we're gonna try to do a tour in the fall and the winter um but you know like even with that I just got a job so now we're gonna have to figure it out around that it's just hard with the scheduling that's really really is scheduling yeah how far out do you book gigs well, we're doing a gig in New York on June fifteenth. Um, I just found out it did sell out this morning. So holy shit! So it's, I can't really promote it, but I hope everybody <laughs> who's so, there enjoys it. You're only, you're only going to do a one off. We're going to do a one off to sell. Sorry, the fourteenth. We're going to do a one off the night of the fourteenth to celebrate the album coming out on the fifteenth. But um, uh, it's kind of like a party show, and it's going to be the two of us. I don't know if you remember Boris Pelik. Who he played in our band and he yeah. came on one time onto your show. We, oh my he, god, yeah, yeah, he brought us there. Um, but <laughs> he's gonna be opening and he's gonna and then he's gonna play with us and stuff. And then hopefully we'll get Jack met to to play some. <laughs> yeah. He's gonna play. He cause sometimes he'll play drums with us and play. That's sick. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, I can't believe Boris is still in your life. I know he's one of my best friends still. But that's really special. Yeah. And he played with Gogol Bardello, that band, for about 10 years, and then he just quit, and so now he's doing his own solo thing, and I'm so happy for him. I think it's great. So you, you can't get tickets to this, but do you plan on doing this more often? <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to try to do a nice, a nice sizable, sizable tour. But how do you route it around acting? It's, that, that is really, really impossible. It's really, really hard. I've tried to, you know, do you know anybody who, do you know anybody else who, who makes yeah. that work? It's really, it's really hard because with acting, you, the schedules of that, you're really at the whim of them. Yeah, you could be six, eight weeks, 16 <laughs> weeks on and you can't really leave, right? I know. I think the only way to make it work is to not book any jobs and just say, I'm touring and that's what I'm doing this year. Right, you'd have to just say that and then you know how acting goes. They go, okay, but just look at this one thing. And you go, oh, fuck, I can't. You know, are you at a point where you're getting offered roles? Or are you going out on auditions? It's about it's about fifty fifty. I mean, I I I go on auditions for things that I they really care about. But you know, I get offered like I got offered the play. I got offered um this this uh, romantic comedy that I did with Lucy Hale. Um, but like the show, the consultant I had to audition for, and and uh, um, you know, it just depends. I I I just yeah. Is depends. there a role you wish you got? Yeah, definitely. There's been a there's been there's been a few. There's been a few, but then you know it always works out. It always definitely works out for the best. But you know, I was like, what? <laughs> I was up for uh, for a lot. I was up for Spider Man. That would have been big. Sick. I was up for uh, Call Me by Your Name. Wow. I didn't even really know I was up for, it, but the director uh, Luca Guadagnino was like, you know, it was really just between you and Timmy. Well, call me by your name. I'm like, oh, bro, don't tell me that now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of things, but it's just like with every actor, there's you know, there's the ones. But then I, you know, there are things where you don't get it, and then an act drops out or something, and then you get. It. I just 
you know, got something that an actor dropped out of that I think didn't think I was going to get. And the business is just unpredictable. But is there something you turned down that you maybe wish you didn't? Um, <laughs> there are. You know, I try to just block them out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is a great movie called uh, Green Room. That I that I turned. Do you remember that movie? Yeah, yeah for for A twenty four. That was that movie was so good, but it ended up starring um, Anton Yelchin, who was incredible, and then passed away. Who was a friend of mine. Um, so it all worked out that 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 he did it. Um, and he's so incredible in the movie. Um, it was like his last real. Wow. Yeah, great. That was meant to happen. Like you, that was meant yeah, to happen you, for sure. That's yeah. yeah. Damn. Do you and Alex ever go out for the same roles? We don't, luckily, because Ow, like, that might be same. awkward. You look the I mean, same person. Sometimes, yeah. We, sometimes <laughs> it's weird we, they do and they don't at the same time. <laughs> right, okay. right. Like, just being honest. Yeah, like, yeah. Some people will say that we do. I mean, I, he definitely he definitely can play. Di- he plays a lot of different ethnicities, and I am not. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so we don't for some reason. But, uh, you know, there'll be some huge roles that every actor in the world goes up for. Um and that you know, like I think, like one of the parts in Superman or something like that. Well, everyone will go up for it, and then, but there hasn't been any. There, there aren't really any where we both are. You know, it's like it's we're either going to go for Nat or Alex. It doesn't really happen. Does making music allow you to get to know your brother in different ways? Totally, totally. I feel like it's a real, it's a real connecting point. And then, and then. It's strange. I'll get little insights into his romantic life and into his his um, sometimes his relationship with our parents or his relationship with his friends just through through songwriting. You know, that's special. That is really it is really really special. I also love hearing his music, him sending me a song because I'm excited to listen to it. You know, when you sometimes a friend will send you a song or or have you watch their movie or something, and you're like, oh. Fuck. But anytime Alex is in it doing anything, I'm so excited because I'm such a big fan of his, you know? There is, like, I mean, one, like, he's you guys are an extension of each other. But also, like, I don't know, to watch you all win. But also to create art that, again, is, like, you don't set rules to these albums, I'm assuming, right? Like, do you put... Set what? Rules? Like, do you <laughs> set any sort of genre, like... You mean guidelines? It's 100 songs. Oh yeah, the album is fucking <laughs> thick and again, Winter Baby is almost 6 minutes in length. He's like, "What happened? You didn't make an album for so long." I'm like, "Well, we made up for an album." Yeah, there's actually four <laughs> albums in the one. So, lucky you. <laughs> did your Oh, sorry, are we going to say something? No. I did, mean, yes, but no. Uh, did your mom sue you? Oh uh, no. Oh, motherfucker. <laughs> I see what um, you're doing here. Um, you're a real trickster, huh? You're the trickster <laughs> of the group. No, my mom didn't sue us. Alex wrote a song called Mother I Heard From Your Lawyer, and people keep asking us that. But really, it's one of our good friends who did have this happen, and uh, Alex wrote the song, but it's so hilarious because now we've been sending the album. They're like, what happened between you and your mom? I'm like, no, my mom's lovely. We're very close <laughs> to their mom. But my mom is like, I just got a text from from my fam- from it was one of our family friends. I just got a text from Barbara saying, "What's going on with you and Alex because of the album track listing?" I'm like, no, mom, it's not you. <laughs> it has to be interesting to have all the success between the two of you. And you said it earlier, like your parents were never super famous, right? right? But they were always really passionate creatives yeah. who really gave their all to their craft. And are super well respected, you know, totally for what they do. Yeah. When they look at you, is it pure pride, or is there any, is there any like glimmer of like I don't, jealousy is the wrong word, but like, no, we're really lucky. I think that's why Alex and I don't have any of that either. I think I think there's something in the family that it 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 you know even though we had to break away from them a little bit, there's something about our quad. It's like a quad bike, and and we're all like you know it's the four of us against the world. Um. No, there's none of that. I mean, I think uh, it's always been, it's it it really because it's always been about the work. It it's it really wasn't a success driven household. Like, oh, you gotta, you know, who's making the most money or who? You know, I know a lot of families are like that, and uh, I think that would be pain. I think that would be painful. Do you believe that's the reason for your acting success? Is that you solely focus on the quality of your work? I mean, I think it means that I have worked my ass off on a lot of the other elements of the of the business of like just being as good an actor as I can be. So I think I think so. But you know, I mean, I still get hung up on 
you know, whether something does well or not. And I'm not above it at all. It's just, um, it's just when I meet other people in this business, I think, oh wow, my priorities are different. I, I, I know, I see that my priorities are different than a lot of people my age. What are your priorities? <clears throat> I think my priorities are being true to myself um, as 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 an artist and as a musician and as an actor and and to um, to do things that I'm proud of and um, and to work really hard and you know I, I I do think that you know moving out to LA a lot of people's priorities are being seen mm. um, and you go to these you know, you go to these Hollywood parties and I usually leave feeling pretty sick mm -hmm. and I wake up in the morning with anxiety and <laughs> you know, I'm just like, Oh God, what did I say to that person or this, you know? Um, but, uh, I, in a weird way, I think that that horse with the blinders on kind of focus has kept me from getting into falling into, you know, the, that Hollywood scene is, is, it's almost like becoming a drug addict or That's something, totally. you know, it's, it's constant value, you know, and I've gone before, especially when you're in something that's popular or something and people are giving you attention and love. It's like that you can eat up that validation and start to feel it's I think it's really bad for you. It's almost as bad as it's like when they say reading good reviews is almost as bad as reading bad reviews. They had this big page of uh, during I was doing the play and we had opening night is this great show. And and then I saw this page that they put up of me and it was all these nice quotes about me from the play and I, th I started to feel like oh wow oh god I got all great reviews people loved me Dude, I came and I had the worst show of the entire run I was just like why did they like me before what did I do before that was so good did it you know and then I thought oh fuck it I can't look at anything like that that shit can destroy you yeah it's just as bad as hearing somebody saying you know you're no good or you know that's not good either it's just I think you got to just keep kind of be try to be as egoless about it as possible do you and alex share those priorities yeah i mean i i think i think i was i was helpful to him about six years ago where i said he was getting all anxious about reviews and stuff and i was like dude you got to stop reading any of them because he, he had gotten all these good reviews and then he got you know some less good ones for something and i was like it's because you got all those good ones that you read because mm. that happened to me that's happened to me too it's like i was in these two movies i was in um <clears throat> this movie Palo Alto and then I was in The Fault in Our Stars and it was just all this love to, and then I literally had a movie come out a month later that got a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes uh, which is fucking incredible. I mean I'm actually proud of it now. What? Was it Grandma? Was it the intern? No, no Grandma and intern were, were, were good. It was, it was it was. It, I'm not going to say it on air but it was with Selena Gomez. It was it, I watched uh, it and I thought this is the worst movie I've ever seen in my life. Behaving badly. But, yeah it's behaving badly. But, but <laughs> I, I, it has a 0% and now I ha wear it as a badge of pride but I thought okay so I went from getting you know all these incredible reviews and you know I had like it was amazing. I had like uh, Daniel Day Lewis tell me he's like, "This is like one of the best performances I've seen this year." That's and crazy. Like the, he's fucking Lincoln. He's fucking Lincoln. I had Lincoln tell me, and I had all this incredible. And then it was like this. And then reviews that were like, "This is the worst movie ever <laughs> made," <laughs> you know. And I was like, "Oh, okay." So you can't you can't really take any of it seriously. No, you need those just, peaks and valleys, baby. Yeah, and then I was actually falling into the pattern a little bit during lockdown of reading some things, and Alex was like. Dude, you're the one who told me not to, and I'm like, you're right. I just live by my own, my own uh, words. Alex does that Daniel Day Lewis shit, doesn't he? <laughs> Wait, which thing? He gets it? into. He's method. <laughs> he is right. I feel like he'd he would be upset if I if I broke his if I talked about any of his. It's his you don't process, need to, but I I, yeah, yeah. I believe it is really a remarkable process that he's he does. I mean, he's an incredible he's an incredible actor. I know that he got um a lot of those those articles when the horror movie came, when hereditary came out but um no i mean everybody loves working with him he's not like one of those people that pisses anybody off or anything like that you guys are real fucking artists <laughs> it's really crazy i mean i've known you from the beginning so it's fucking sick like so are you zach you're the best you're the best in the business you got to take a fucking compliment zach well maybe 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 in the next 15 years Give yeah, it to me. Get, feel, once we are you 30. feeling are you feeling um you must be feeling good with where you're at um it's a, you know uh, How are you feeling? I'm feeling, you know, I feel good. I'm not I mean, this show is, comfortable. 
you're not comfortable, but 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 this show is sort of where this is where you've wanted to be, right? Yeah, I, and I also think that there's so much more to grow, and there's so much more. Where, to what, do. What's your what's your biggest ambition? I don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, I really love interviewing people, and it really drives me, and it keeps me going. And I love making great radio, and I love taste making and curating playlists, and I love innovating and being here at Amazon that allows me to yeah, be yeah. an entrepreneur. Um, but I, you know, I want to maybe, I don't know, host, host some things. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of thing would you I host? do? Like maybe, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh, sometimes I wake up, I'm like, oh, I want to take over for Carson Daly on the voice. Do that as one of the jobs. Be amazing. Yeah. You know, maybe do Why, like a, could you, you could do a talk show. Midday talk show. I've been thinking about that. What about an evening? What about a late night? Uh, I'm more like stand up. Uh, yeah. They, somebody else can do that. I don't yeah. Know. But I also like, Midday I really do love radio. Who does that? Like who, who, who are examples? Of I like, uh, I like that Kelly and Ryan format. Like maybe me and yeah, one of my that would friends. Be great. Yeah. yeah. I'd love like me and Liz Gillies to host a show like that. That would be amazing. She's a special yeah. one. I don't know. I, I, I love have, how like, you just thrown your friend to the, you know. I, you know, I, I'm throwing her out there. Yeah. I'm attaching <laughs> her to a project. Um, <laughs> just fucking kidding. Uh, I remember you guys used to hang out a lot. Yeah, we're just one of my best friends. Yeah. I really, uh, and, and to be honest, like when I go dark as fuck, she will call me a thousand times. And yeah, yeah. Answer. She's one of them. She's do you get, do you, do, you, do, you, do you have to fight the... The sad bug, the depression. Oh, all the time. Yeah. And it fucking creeps in consistently. Yeah. You too? What, of course. What do you, what do you do to combat it? Nothing. And that's, like, well, to be honest, like, I think it's fucked up. Like, I, I kind of lean into it. Mm, and yeah. then all of a sudden I'll just wake up one day and I'll be like, maybe today's like the day I, like, talk to the world. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to move out. Yeah. Of this place. Yeah. But it's not good. I'm, you go to therapy? Yes. I mean, come on. Yeah. yeah well, therapy's for the last like eight, eight, seven years or something. Wow. Same therapist? Yeah, the bet. He's the greatest. That's amazing. He's the greatest. That's yeah. a re that's healthy. He's incredible. Yeah. Have I you mean, been in love? Definitely. Yeah. 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 Um How do you know? Have you? Yeah, I think so. I was just talking about a friend last night and I thought, you know the thing when you when you're uh, you know, when you're start to really care for somebody and then music sounds different. <laughs> You know, we're all kind of fighting for that because he was in this relationship and it was this long term relationship. He said, the Music never sounded different. I was like, I don't think you were in love. <laughs> That's, wow. Yeah. It makes but, sense. But yeah, I mean, I like the idea that, that, um, you know, you have that first jolt with somebody that you need. You need that thing where you're like, Oh my God, I, I'm crazy about this person. But at a certain point, it just becomes doing nice things for each other. That's you know, taking just doing care nice things them. for you, being there for you. When they get a cold, you bring them soup. You know, real love is patient. Real love is just patience, and it's like day by day, and it's not these big things. It's kind of the little, th little things. One hundred percent. And it's also judgment free. I yeah. really like you know, yeah. staying when you really should be fucking running. What do you mean? Wait. What do you Sometimes, mean? like uh, you know, well, so, yeah. maybe you should run. No, I, I, there's something. Yeah, but there's like, uh, I are don't you know. in love? Yeah, I think so. Are you not? Are you in a thing? Nah, I mean, it, I don't know what it is. Just some, like I'm existing. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you were always really, really private about your uh, about your about your love life. I remember. Like, uh, and I'm not. I'm less private today. I'll tell you that much. Mainly because it's Good. undefined and it's, it's something without being anything. Does that make sense? Yeah. But what totally. I am also learning is that. Relationships are unique to those people yeah. and not... And there's no judgment. Totally. And there's no one formula to a quality relationship. So and you're in a relationship with five different people about in the house and you guys all live in a house, kind of like a reality show. I, I'm actually yeah. on Big Brother. <laughs> um, I didn't want to reveal this way, but I am one of the newest contestants. Uh, Winter Baby is about who? <laughs> Dude, Winter Baby I wrote when I was 17. And I've been playing that song live for like 10 years. And then people were just asking for it so much. I was like, we should record this song. It was such a great live song. Um, Winter Baby, I wrote actually about a high school girlfriend. High school girlfriend. But it was kind of before we started dating. And I remember it was one of my first times really getting high, getting stoned, which I don't really like to do anymore. I don't really smoke weed anymore. But in 17, 18, I was all into it. We used to smoke weed back then. We used to smoke weed all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I remember getting high with you on 420 in a fucking apartment that was literally the size of maybe a shoebox. Sam Gustafson's house. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I remember just getting uncomfortably high yes. and being like, I think 
you somebody's got to take me home. <laughs> <laughs> that was like one of the first times I ever got really high. I remember I remember you going real quiet. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we put on like a record. We put on like an Elton John record or something. And then everybody, you know, it's that weird thing. We were all like super excited. And you're like, we're all going to get stoned together. And then, then suddenly everybody's <laughs> just like thinking about their lives. <laughs> thinking about like, I remember that sad thing that happened at camp one time. You're just kind of like in your own. Isn't you know, it weird like, that like those memories stick with you even yeah. though you've lived so much fucking life? <laughs> I know. That's I know. nuts. And I forget sometimes somebody will be like, oh, you worked with this person. I'm like, fuck, I've worked with that person. And I completely have forgotten. But then little things from, from high school or from middle school, yeah, will stick but with those me. Are, I don't want to say like those are some of the important stuff, but it I kind know. of is. It is. It is. Yeah, those little moments. I still talk to Sam all the time. I'll tell him you said hi. Yeah, please. No, you didn't. No, I see. <laughs> Sam was also on Citadel. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> who wasn't on Citadel? I, just, I remember Gillies just, was on Citadel. <laughs> <laughs> Graham Phillips was on Citadel. Wow. Hi, Graham. I love you. <laughs> Wait, so why are you? <laughs> I love how some artists are like, you know, they sit on records and then they just move on. You're yeah, like, no, yeah, no, yeah. no. This needs to be enshrined on an album forever. I mean. How many songs are made new for this, and how many songs are things from the past? Everything but that song. So all the songs but that song were were new, but um, but that song it was just a holdover, and I'm like, we got to record this song because it can't. We did like a whole new version of it. We were on the last day, and we had this whole instrumental wild section, and then we we cheers because it was the end, and we had some champagne, and I think Alex had like a shot or something, and he was like, Alex is kind of a little wasted, and he was like. You know what? Before we like close up shop, he's like, "Let me throw a solo down on that thing." We never solo really, <laughs> and I was like, "All right." Now I'm a little drunk to him. All right, and then Alex gets the guitar, he does this solo on "Winter Baby," and uh, I start crying. <laughs> I was like, "Dude, we gotta put this on the album. This is amazing." And he's like, "I blacked out, man." <laughs> and it's really my, my maybe my favorite part of the album now because it was something about it was so. Drunk, no, so it was like, nostalgic. Yeah, it was really beautiful, and and it just felt like it felt like the closing piece to the album. And then I knew we were done. It was just something about it, it was really beautiful. And uh, so that song is really special to me in that way too. But uh, yeah, it was really like a, it was really like a first, you know, it was like a seventeen, eighteen year old feeling. The song, the rest of them are more sort of adult, but something about that song stuck around. It's beautiful. Thanks, man. Is the table for two for you and Alex or for uh, <laughs> you and somebody else? Uh, I mean, I think the reason we call the album Table for Two is because it's, uh, you know, it was Alex and me. But, yeah, he wrote the song about having a dream about an ex where where he kept, um, you know, uh, you know, when you have those dreams about exes, it always happens to me. You know, you, you it's as soon as you start to feel, oh, I'm over it, that's when you start having the dreams, you know, because mm. it's just, it is like losing a limb. You know, you're losing this person that was right next to you for so long, and he's ha and so he's having this dream where they're together, and then they're kind of, you know, they kiss, but then he's saying, whoa, I don't think I am with you anymore. And it was like that weird, that sort of dream logic where you go, is this supposed to be happening, but I miss you, and, you know... Um, I would, oh, oh, fucking, I'd wake up in a cold sweat. <laughs> I would, I would. Yeah. My biggest yeah. fear is like, like, getting in real deep with somebody and then having to fucking do it with somebody else. Uh, that I mean, that's why people don't. That's why it's hard to. That's why it's hard to commit because you know, as soon as you commit to somebody, it's either you're gonna get married for the rest of your life or you're gonna get some heartbreak. And that is yeah. like, you know, that's the risk. That's the trust fall. That's why you got to do the trust fall. Yeah. Like, oh, fuck. Like, we've, like, you know, you, you ride with somebody, ride through a lot of things. But usually it is better to feel, it is usually better to go through life feeling things than not. Although being single for the last couple of years for me has been pretty amazing. Really? And it's been really great and, and healthy. And I just hadn't been single for a really long time. So it's been, it's been really nice. And, and things, you know, I've learned a lot about myself from it. But as my therapist says, it is usually better to go through life with somebody else than, than without. Nah, bad therapist. <laughs> Don't you have a girlfriend? Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> like, <what? laughs> no, you know you see the 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 fifty year old single guy who's like, yeah, man, I met this cool girl, and you're like, oh god, <laughs> that's my fear, dude. That's like, you know, I've already commit like come to terms with the fact that I'll end up maybe with two or three husbands, but like, 
at the end of the day, it's like you need. I want somebody. You know? You're gonna have two or three husbands. Yeah, probably. You know, Zach, I didn't even know you're gay. Oh my, oh yeah. Until this moment, that's yeah. all. I mean, I had a feeling, but I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I knew, but uh, we never spoken about it before. Yeah, you were always yeah. really private about it. Yeah. Well, now you know. So you did you uh, come out publicly or in any kind of way? Not like not in really? a like a legitimate no, fashion. Just kind of just. Well, they kind of know. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. like if you. Yeah, I knew. But, I mean, like yeah, like I mean, yeah. tens and tens of millions of people have seen Ariana Grande tell me to suck a dick. So, I would you know it's What's very the story popular. there. What was? I mean, literally, I, I don't. What is the story? I think she just said it. Yeah, you're. The, he's a historian. I don't remember shit. To be was honest. it kind of like suck a dick or no? It was more like that was literally the bit. It was like suck yeah. a dick, Zach saying, but not like suck a dick, like. Suck a dick. Like, want, hey, man, suck a dick. Yeah, I want yeah. that for you type deal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's a... Uh, I'm happy for you. Yeah, for, for many, for a couple of years... But you think you'd have three husbands, not just one. I would hope... Th- I, At I want one time one. or go through three? No, go through three. Go through three. But right. I want you have one. one. I was thinking three in a big house and that big brother kind of <laughs> way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the first guy yeah. I ever, like, actually was going out on dates with ended up calling it off with me to join a thruple. No way. Yeah, he's been in that thruple ever since. Tiger King vibes. <laughs> Fuck yeah. yeah. Yeah, eight years later, he's still there. Oh, he's still in it. Yeah, yeah. Give well, I mean, cold. you can't. I mean, who? You know, at least you can spread your heartbreak and jealousy to two people That's, as opposed to one. How, how crazy is that concept? <laughs> it, like sometimes I think about like being able to do an open relationship. And also, you're never going to be able to be two people. No. So you no. can't say, "Oh, I'm not as good as two people." You know what <laughs> I mean? They're two whole people. <laughs> I can never be that. Yeah, you can you. never be two people. Yeah. No. Would you do an open relationship with somebody? Um. I don't know. I, I, I get real. I, I have. I definitely. Would, I might get too jealous. Um. I de- I, I definitely feel like I'm more of a, a one person kind of guy. Yeah. One trick pony. That's not what one trick pony <laughs> means. <laughs> <laughs> that you were this <laughs> this years old when you when you learned what one trick pony means. <laughs> Can you do your uh, Bruce Wayne voice? Oh Jesus! Did you hear the story? Did you hear the story? Or this is this is a real story? So I came in. I got this part to play Bruce Wayne in this cartoon, and I showed up going like, <laughs> hello, here we go. So, uh, you know, I was doing like an entire, like I had, it was basically Bale in, in those <laughs> movies. and uh, But I would really worked it, and I was so excited, and I kind of learned all the lines like that. And I did about two hours, and we took a lunch break, and I guess they sent it to the studio, and they came back, and they're like, hey, so they, they hired you because they like your real voice. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, I, 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 don't, I don't think I can do it. And then I called my manager and I'm like, hey, I, I, I really don't think I can do it. I, I, I figured out a voice for this. And it was like Superman. Because, you know, it's I mean, the I don't even I don't even really know the plot of the of the movie. But I was like, I was really gung ho on this. This really wet. Wha- also, it wasn't totally bail. I put my own spin on it. I felt proud. I felt proud of myself. And then um, my manager sort of talked. I said, I think I got to leave. I don't think I can do this. My manager sort of talked me down and she was like, look, this is, you know, they, they, you're playing a 16 year old Batman. So I think they want you to talk like yourself. So I came back kind of angry and then I started doing it and yeah, it's fine. So, so what is it? Turn it on. No, the fucking voice is my voice. He's been doing now, it for an hour. This is it? No, this is this is all I do now. They they didn't want anything. Like like even then I was kind of doing like like a Batman that was, hey man, we're gonna. And they're like, no, really, we want your voice. And I was like, I don't want to do that. And they're like, do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So then yeah, I got stuck with it. But so now you can just. It's basically <laughs> this. I, this could be Batman this entire time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I tr- I had so many different trials for Batman too. I was like, what if Batman was. Kind of English. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I could go any direction with it. And then I thought, what if Batman was kind of weird? <laughs> and kind of like a freaky and like, you know, like like sort of like a crazy guy. that Like, you know, almost like Batman was the Joker because Batman is an odd guy. Sure. And I was like, what if he's really manic? And they're like, we just want you to do <laughs> your voice. <laughs> like just you're- speak like yourself and say these lines. So then I'm like... Hey man, Superman is blah 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 blah, and then I'm, yeah, I I got into it, but there was about an hour I was just pissed off. <laughs> it's fucking funny. <laughs> By the way, listen to Table for Two. Also, the entire Naked Brothers band, but really, fuck that. You can listen to that, but Nat and Alex Wolf is what you want to listen to. 
the whole catalog is on Amazon Music, but Naked Brothers Band still, the catalog yeah. lives on Amazon Music. I know. On Amazon Music, it's you can still listen to Crazy Car. You know, on Spotify, for some reason, you can't listen to Crazy Car. But So Paramount so sort of owns a- that trademark. Did that surprise you when they bought Naked Brothers Band off you? Like, not off you, but... Yeah, I mean, you know, there was always weird things. Like, when we were kids, we were I was watching TV. I was probably 12, and I was watching TV, and I saw a Subway commercial, and I went... Oh my God! My, and I heard doo dee doo dee. I was like, my song's in a subway commercial, and uh, my parents go, No, it's not. And I'm like, Yes, it is. They're like, No, it probably just sounds like it. And then it was, and they were kind of ripping us off or something. And we got ended up getting paid for it. But yeah, there's always been tricky stuff with that. But then um, it's wild how people will still, uh, you know, like on TikTok. There's been all these Naked Brothers no, been songs forever. just like blowing up on TikTok and and. Uh, and then our song, uh, my our one of our singles from this album, "All Over You," blew up on TikTok, and we didn't even we, we never made a TikTok for it. It Just became one of the songs that people put in the back of their their TikToks or something. What so, does that prove to you? I don't know. I never. Th- I mean, I don't even. I I went on TikTok for three weeks, and I thought this is so addictive, so fun, and so evil <laughs> that mm. I have to get off because like. Immediately, they start pl- the algorithm starts showing me all the things I don't want to see. You know what I mean? Totally. Um, but so I got off it. So I don't think of myself as a TikTok person. But but it really, I guess, it shows that our you know our music still connects with people. It you resonates. Know? Yeah. Without you, really, it, it always finds the right audience. It always finds the right audience. Yeah, it's been crazy. And then you know, like Glue, Alex's song had so all these good. millions of uh, you know plays on Spotify and all these things and. And we don't re- – it's not like we tour. It's not – you know, it's just I think the music just kind of gets through. But uh, but honestly, I'm not just saying this. You have been very, very helpful, especially for, like, uh, Rules. And um, I can't remember what the other song is called, but you – Rockstar, you played all those songs on, on air. Get out of town, first yeah. of all. And also you would do these things where – I remember you you would take your shirt off and you'd do videos with your shirt off talking oh, about our music. Always. And those videos would blow up. First, because your shirt was off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'd say, I want to see Sang with a shirt off kind of thing. Yeah, that was... And, and people would be like, Sang, 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 take I remember shirt this. off, Sang, This Sang. is actually a really, is a very, very, very vivid moment in my yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a last dark time. time. I, it was but, a dark time. It was the last life. time I took my shirt off, actually. Yeah, yeah, because you're a never nude. <laughs> I am a never nude. I do exclusively shower in clothes. Yeah, yeah. I have a body, like a wetsuit that I wear. You All the time. Yeah, yeah, All under what I'm wearing right now. You have three husbands, and none of them have seen you naked. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> That's going to ruin the fucking illusion. They're going to leave me real quick. <laughs> no, 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 no. Anybody who's getting intimate with me, it's pitch black, and I'm yeah. wearing a f- fucking six-piece suit. Yeah, yeah, or like in Arrested Development, you're wearing one of those those jean shorts. Mm, I love those. Or a chastity belt. Or a chastity belt. you got to do it once in a while, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, the metal hits. Um, listen to Table for Two, please. We're going to put a link listen in the description to below. Two. Um, it, it makes whoa. It makes whoa, me happy. That's that Celsius. Yeah, I'm right. ready for Celsius number two. We can, <laughs> I got one for you. You do? Uh, of course. Hit me with it. Let's go. Here, here. I am really jazzed that you continue to make music because I, I ultimately think that for society and for kids and for people who grew up with it, it just matters. It's because it's become such a part of the way they operate and live. And the music has really etched itself into people's lives. So I, do you think more than the, do you think that, it, do you think in any way it's been more than before? I think, well, I think glue really fucking did it. Oh, I, oh, I just meant, Oh, I thought you were mean? talking about music in general. Oh no, I'm talking about you, but I think music in general, I think honestly has, become more fleeting. You know, the democratization of the, the music industry has led to more songs to come and go and more one-hit wonders in the last few years than we've seen right. in a long time. Um, what do you think that is? Well, I think w- when anybody has the opportunity to go viral and yeah, the, yeah. the platform is at your fingertips, it everything changes. Like, you know, th- there's no barrier to entry anymore. I mean, there still is to get songs to a certain place and to grow it. But but, but less... you can kind of hit based off. Totally. I don't want to, I won't say who it was, but I did read this, this, it was the TikTok, you know, she started on TikTok, she's a singer songwriter, and I saw she, she posted this thing about, and I think she's talented, she posted this thing about canceling her tour dates because of, you know, she was feeling exhausted. And, and I, I, I got, it really pissed me off because I thought, you know, people have just gone through COVID where all their concert tickets were canceled. And then also it's hard. Like you get you get concert tickets like a lot of times you have to get a hotel 
No, you know, it's a lot of money. Their, it's a huge They're hard-earned money to go see you. And, uh, you know, I just feel like that's very emblematic of the music industry right now. It's sort of, I don't know, it's it's not, you know, I think, you know, a lot of the great, the uh, the greats that we all love, and even the great pop stars, like the the Justin Timberlakes or Bieber, and they're like workhorses. Oh, yeah. You know, Taylor Swift is like the hardest, wor- I mean, I've ever seen, the hardest worker I've ever seen. So it's just, it is kind of this, all right, I'll just kind of write a song and then I'm feeling a little exhausted, like this TikTok. Um, it's a little blasé, man. And they're kind of... blasé. And, 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 and you're like, this isn't going to last. And also, I if I book tickets to your show and then you cancel it because you were tired, I wouldn't book tickets to your show again. 100%. You know? that, by the way, it ruins the relationship with you and that artist. Right. And, and everything's going to be different from that moment on. And ultimately, like, making music is a gift and being able to foster and build a community off that music is an even bigger you're gift so, so lucky i mean you're Fuck so yeah. lucky to, to be able to do what what artists do and make a living off it and actually have people want to go see you you know i mean maybe they're either in this particular case maybe she's maybe she's struggling mental health or something where it's something that we don't know but in general it does feel like a new trend of kind of uh uh not caring about your audience and and not putting in the work that it, you know, that shit, like, oh, my God. Sorry. Pisses me off, yeah. Yeah, it, by the way, yeah. it should. It, it yeah, really yeah. should. I think I know who you're talking about. <laughs> Don't say it. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> oh, I want to know. Um, by the way, listen to Table for Two. All of it on Amazon Music. All of Nat and Alex's music on Amazon Music. And, yes, you can listen to the Naked Brothers Band also on Amazon yeah. Music. Uh, final thoughts, Daniel? I think we covered a lot here. Oh, we did. I really appreciate you and love you. Oh, I love day. you so much, Zach. Thank you so much for having me. Man. It's not every day I get to have an old friend in the studio and we really get to catch up. I really appreciate you beautiful. beyond. And you should listen to this album. It's a fuck ton of songs. I mean, is it like 25? Is it, is no, it's fif- It's 15. So why did it look what I was scrolling and listening oh, to yeah, this yeah, morning? Oh, yeah, it feels like... It's, it, when no, you scroll, but, oh, you just scroll and scroll. But I think you, you know, in the link that I had, you had separate tracks for the voice memos and stuff. Right. So it did it, when I, I was think it gets yeah maybe that gets up to seventeen or something yeah well, yeah it hit it a little bit longer why do you, why are the voice memos required and vital to the storytelling process I think we put in the voice memo of all over you for the 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 album only because um, it, it's so diametrically opposed to the version that's on the album the version on the album is almost like a it's we were inspired by. Prince production and kind of and, and AJR and those people do kind of like a pop our version of a pop song, um, but when I wrote that song, that's actually a voice memo that I wrote the the night I wrote it and I I sent it to somebody right at the beginning of a relationship who I was falling in love with and there was something sort of um, I f- you know in sending it to people they were like this is kind of moving and I I, I I like the version but I would love to hear this version so I don't know it, it, it ended up being it's very sad it's very personal and you know I'm even like there's one moment where I'm even laughing because of an inside joke that's in the lyrics of the song or something so it felt sweet to have it on the on the record that vulnerability is what people connect to and uh, there's like you can't duplicate that ever again right totally it's, it's it was the night you wrote it and yeah that I, and I think she was going out of town it was kind of that romantic. I just wrote it. I'm going to send it to you. I'm feeling all these feelings. And I mean, that's, uh, I've sometimes in, in my love life and stuff, it's been hard for me to express how, and, and really understand how I'm feeling. And, and it really is through music that, that I'm able to, 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 to figure it out. And, and then to, to express it, it's been much easier for me. How are you guys writing? Do you write to like, are you doing an instrumental and then writing songs? Are you starting with lyrics? What's that process? It goes back and forth, but I think um, my a lot of the songs in this album have come together. Like that song "Moon" that's at the end of it. I don't know if you listened to that one yet, but um, but it is that's one of my favorite on the record, and, and it was inspired by Martha by Tom Waits. I listened to that song and I was really moved by it, and. Um, and then I wrote the song actually pretending, Moon, I wrote pretending to be Tom Waits. So I was like, Moon, you're so far away. Kind of like acting or something where I did like a, a fake voice and somehow that got me the song. I did my Batman voice. That's pretty, <laughs> but that's pretty cool that you were able to combine both worlds a little bit and take on a yeah, character. Totally. Totally. Is I that feel song, like that happens to me a lot with, with music. Yeah. Are you writing from imagination or are you writing from reality? I think somewhere, somewhere between. Um, but... But a lot of times I'll write, I'll have little images and, and, but you know, usually the feelings come from reality, come from some kind of 
real place of heartbreak or 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 love or or you know the the song with my uh, about my dad you know that was pretty pretty clear but really the you know I didn't I thought I was writing a song about um you know how painful it was that my dad was sick but really I was kind of writing a song about um my own guilt about the way I handled it um and that only really I only understood that when I was recording the song I'd already written and then I realized oh this is kind of about my guilt about it you know that's fucking art man. yeah um you know it's like and then being like oh you you know, one of the verses like joked three years was all he had. And I just laughed. How cavalier did I forget? I'd lose my dad because, you know, there were these times I just had a real, you know, when that was happening with my dad, I had a real emotional disconnect. Um, but it's strange how sometimes it takes me into perform, uh, you know, performing in the studio or on stage to really understand what I was writing about. It's like last night, there's this song off the new national album that I didn't really like that much. Eucalyptus, the song. And I heard it on stage, and I went, oh, my God, I didn't understand it. That's what it was. Yeah. This song is fucking brilliant. Um, it was like, because I thought, oh, he's just listing things. He's like, D I don't know if you've heard it, but he's like, eucalyptus. He's just li listing a bunch of stuff in his house. But then I was like, oh, this is a breakup song about, you know, I'm just going to leave all this shit for you. I'm going to go. And if I, he, and then he says, if I miss it, I'll visit. And somehow that line last night when he was singing, it hit me. And I thought, oh, that's so heartbreaking. That's you know, when you leave a relationship, you just leave a bunch of, sh you know, you, you leave, you just leave a bunch of feelings there, you know, and you leave a bunch of yourself and your, um, and it was so, so beautiful. I'm not sure if he's going through a divorce or something, but it felt, you felt the pain. Yeah. See, table for two, link in the description below. I really appreciate your time and energy. And I also appreciate the fact that you continue to make music. It makes me very happy. So oh, don't I'm, stop. I missed you so much. I hope that I can, let's, let's do this more often. You can it's come on so the show nice. whenever, but like, let's get dinner. You live here. I would you love have, you that. Now, so now I'm living there. I'll be in New York for about a month. I'm back July for life. Okay, great. I will text you. We, I still I have your number. Love that. Please text me after this. I will. I love you so much. You're the best I interviewer in the world and you're the best guy. And I'm so happy for all the great things that have happened. Well, yeah. And I'm gay. So. And you're gay. What a, what a, what a day hey. to be alive. What a time. You were always gay. I was always gay. <laughs> Dan, you good? Yes, sir. Nat Wolf, everybody. Love you, buddy. Love you.